I think we're live. We're in. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. It's so great to see you. You too. Thank you for coming. I'm going to introduce myself and then introduce you, and then we're going to dive into the excitement of book chatting. So um, for anyone who doesn't know me, thank you so much for joining us. Happy Sunday. My name is Jeannie DeVita. I own Romance Writing Academy. Um, we teach romance writing. I'm a book editor, and I also am a ghostwriter. I write about half a million words of romance content a year. So I love this genre, and I love being able to bring amazing, amazing authors to people who just want to get to know their favorite authors better, or maybe you're an aspiring author and you want to learn to do it. We are hearing from one of the best today. So I'm so excited to have Roan Parrish. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to read part of your bio just so that everyone knows a little bit more about you. Um, I'm sure most people who are going to attend absolutely know who you are. But let's just share a bit of the basics. So Roan Parrish, who we adore, lives in Philadelphia. And when you're not writing, uh, you can usually be found cutting your friend's hair. Could I recruit you, please? Much needed at this time. Absolutely. <laughs> Seriously, meandering through whatever city you're in while listening to Torch songs and metal, melodic death metal. That's a wonderful mouthful and I can hear it already. Or <laughs> overly elaborate meals. Uh, Rowan loves bonfires, winter beaches, minor chord harmonies, and self-tattooing. And thanks, good goodness for all of us, you also love writing. So thank <laughs> you so much for joining us. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Can't wait to chat. And uh, it's a it's a rainy afternoon here, so I'm excited to to dive into some writing talk. Yay! Something sparkly and fun, sunshiny when it's not not <laughs> a beautiful day. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just put up this gorgeous book. I loved it so so much. Oh. Like laugh, laugh, cry, savor every page. But it's it's only one of a lot of the books that you've written already and published series standalones could you want to just give us a quick like big picture what have you published tell us about your place in romance and then we'll talk more specifically about it yeah sure um i love that question your place in romance i think that's a great way to put it um i would say my place in romance the kind of stuff that i write is um character driven and interiority driven romance that takes place in the real world with all of its concomitant challenges, politics, uh, disappointments, desires, and uh, happy, happily ever afters. Um, so my first series was In the Middle of Somewhere, and that's a, a kind of like <clears throat> longer, maybe a little bit grittier romance series, different characters in each book. And then I have a spinoff series of Small Change, which is a queer MF romance with um, Ginger, one of my favorite characters. Um, and she is the best friend of Daniel, who was in my first book. And then there's, there's two books in that series. So that's like a five book kind of thing generally. And then I have multiple standalones. I have a standalone called Heart of the Steel. That's about an FBI art crimes agent who falls in love with an art thief that I co-wrote with the lovely Avon Gale, which was a really fun project. Um, and I have Thrall, which is a Dracula retelling. Um, and one of my favorites, um, the remaking of Corbin Whale, which is sort of like my very queer take on practical magic uh, kind of romance. And the Riven series is a kind of like anti rock star romance, maybe. It's about a rock star who hates being a rock star. And um, yeah, that. Basically, all my books take place in what is, in my mind, the same universe. Mm -hmm. um, and if you read all of them, you will find like little Easter eggs that connect all the books. Um, I don't think that there, yeah, almost all of them have at least one little Easter egg that will lead you to another another book. Isn't that the most satisfying thing for, for you as a reader when you find those Easter eggs? Yeah. And you're like, ah, thank goodness. Oh my gosh, I when I first learned that that was a thing you could do, I, sorry, this is like really a, a tangent. Do you want me to go on a tangent already? It's like minute three. Um, minute. <laughs> when, the way I still remember the way I learned that that was a thing you could do because it actually like changed my understanding of writing forever because I, I, I was in middle school and I had, I was a huge fan of Essie Hinton who wrote The Outsiders and all of those books. I was obsessed with those books as a kid and I, I have always loved to read and I, guess that as a kid I thought that books just like 
appeared. Of course, I knew people wrote them, but I didn't really think about it. And I was in the, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which has like a very robust public library system. And every week when my mom would go to some like class at the Y, she would drop me off at the library because it was right across the street. And I would just kind of wander through all the stacks and pick out my books for the week or whatever. And I was in the young adult section and I found like a nonfiction book about Essie Hinton's books. Mm-hmm. And I I read it while I was waiting to meet my mom. And someone in the book, like one of the essayists, explained that the hitchhiker, wait, sorry, spoiler alerts for <laughs> from the 1970s, um, that the hitchhiker in that was then, this is now, no, in Tex, sorry. Uh, the hitchhiker in Tex is supposed to be the the character from that was then, this is now. And there was this crossover situation. Sorry, this you don't know, as he hinted, this makes means nothing to you. The point is there was a crossover, an unnamed character from another book. And I I was probably 12 years old and I was like, wait, <laughs> you can just write something from one of your books into another book and like not tell anyone about it. This is magical. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And I, I, I went to meet up with my mom and she was like, oh, what were you reading? And I was like, did you know? you can have a character be in in a different book blah blah blah. and she was like that's nice dear um you know she did know that that was allowed but I still think about that every time I write in a little easter egg because I found it so delightful and satisfying and have since then every time I've come across one and um yeah so thanks Essie Hinton I know. I think right. you're kind of a raging asshole now, now that you have a Twitter, and I'm sorry to hear about it, but I loved you when I was 11 and 12 years old. And thank you. Taught you craft. That's what you needed. Right. <laughs> oh, and that's the funny thing is I never, ever heard them called Easter eggs until Taylor Swift. Like, as a writing, like my writing oh. universe, I heard breadcrumbs. Like, you put down a thread, you pick it up, you leave a trail of breadcrumbs. <laughs> but, all right, personal confession, learned it from Taylor Swift, so. <laughs> That's really, that. I, I only ever learned it from, um, like, extras in um, movie, like, DVD extras or whatever. And I, as a Jewish person, was like, oh, that's so weird. Why are they called Easter eggs? Yeah. Is it religious or something? And then finally someone was like, well, because you go on Easter egg hunts and they hide them. And I was like, oh, I don't know what these people do. But Exactly. Well, there you go. Now you have so many terms. It can be breadcrumbs. It can be, make something up wonderful. That would be great. But Easter yeah. eggs. Are- <laughs> That so when you okay, so young, go back to 12, you were a big reader. Did you yeah. ever read as a child? Did you think of writing? Like, how did you end up thinking this was a thing you could even do? You know, I um I was a huge reader and I wrote, okay, this is <laughs> this is embarrassing. Uh speaking of Essie Hinton, I once wrote I, I, I guess it is fan fiction, although I didn't know the term then as an 11 year old, but I wrote an entire book, like a note, full lined notebook length book um, that was basically like uh, from the outsiders. There's this one scene where Derry is like, you're going to go to the boys home. If anyone finds out that you're being bad or whatever, if you get in trouble again. And I wrote this, a uh, book where Soda Pop and Pony Boy get taken to a boy's home and the rest of the outsiders have to rescue them. Like that was what I wrote. And it was so gay. And so like I, as an 11 year old, I didn't know that, but I, as a like queer adult, I'm like, oh my God, of course. I was just imagining it as this like found family, like this homoerotic found family where they all have to stick together and they all do these things. So yeah, so I wrote, I guess my first like real piece of writing was a an Essie Hinton fan fiction that does exist. I actually found it when I was cleaning my old room at my parents' house earlier this year. Um, it's in a neon green notebook and I didn't read it, but I will. Uh, so yeah, I always really wanted to write. I wrote horrible poetry and didn't ever let anyone read it. But as a kid, I it never occurred to me that I could be a writer. Like it didn't, um, it didn't occur to me that that could be a job or that that was something that was accessible. I thought of writers as like rock stars or movie stars, um, like people who lived on high and sort of like the the product dropped from the 
Mount Olympus or something and was distributed to us mere mortals. And there was, there was like, you could write a fan letter and mail it and like, maybe it would get there. And like, maybe Santa's real too. I don't know. But I, yeah, it was not a reality for me. And so what changed? How did you, I mean, so you have a neon green notebook with your first story in it. And by the way, I should mention anyone that has questions, please pop them into the chat. I can see them and we'll share them. So please feel free. So how did you get from neon green notebook to doing it? You know, okay, so I was technically a poetry major in college. I went to a really small liberal arts college and um, was an English major and you could like technically um, like, I don't know what the word is, concentrate in poetry or fiction. Um, so I loved writing and that kind of stuff, but I still didn't really think of it as being a, like it was just something that I did. It wasn't something that I expected to go anywhere. And I went and got my PhD in English and assumed that I was gonna be an English professor. And I loved grad school. I've always loved school. I'm an incredible nerd, love learning, love talking about ideas. Um, and then when it came time, like I got, I finished my degree and it was time to go on the job market and there were just no jobs. Or I mean, there were a few jobs, but I didn't get any of them. And um, I was living in Philadelphia. I was adjunct teaching at an art college, which is an absolute nightmare, just as big a nightmare as you would imagine it would be. And I was working as a standardized patient, which anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's like a your job is to basically be someone that medical students can practice on for things like taking a history or doing a lung exam, like nothing intrusive. Um, but, and then you, you pay attention to whether they do it right and you give them feedback. And it's, it's a cool program. It's like a way to attempt to train doctors not to be such incredible assholes and care about people and stuff. And it was fine, but um, not my life's work. And I visited a friend from grad school, my friend Ani, who's wonderful and is actually like someone who reads all my books first. She's like my alpha reader. Um, and I was visiting her and she's a friend from grad school and she'd gotten a job in Arizona and moved for work as a professor. And she was one of my few friends who also read romance. I didn't start reading romance until grad school I ever. Um, but we both read it and she was having a hard time and it was hard to make friends. And she was like, I really wish that there was a romance novel about someone like me, you know, a new professor, someone who doesn't know that many people and feels kind of like a fish out of water because it would be so comforting to read that. And I said, well, I'll, I'll write it for you. I'll write you a story. No problem. And on the plane home from Arizona to Philadelphia, I wrote the first chapter of what would become in the middle of somewhere, thinking that it was just like a little one off thing and Ani would be like amused by it or whatever. And so when, when I landed, I sent it to her thinking she would write back like, oh my God, you're such a nerd. I didn't think you'd really do it. But she wrote back and she was really into it. She was like, I have to know what happens to Daniel. Tell me everything. And so then I wrote another chapter and I emailed it to her and she wrote back and was like, okay, this is what I think is going to happen, but what's really going to happen? And in my head, I was like, well, I don't know because this does not exist. Uh, and I basically wrote that book chapter by chapter, emailing it to her just for her. Um, and there were, speaking of Easter eggs, there were like little um, things that I thought she specifically would think were funny. She's a romanticist. And so some of the books that I mentioned, Daniel teaching, there's like a colleague who's a romanticist who's a total whack job. Um, and I just thought that she would get a kick out of it. And about halfway through, I was like, well, okay, this is getting long. I should figure out what's going to happen. But when I finished it, when I sent her the last, the epilogue, she was like, well, obviously you have to try to publish this and then you have to start writing me the next book because this is so, this is like my favorite part of the day is like checking to see if you sent a new chapter. <laughs> it was so nice. I had never considered publishing it. I had never read romance before the last few years. And I, yeah, I, sent it into a publisher and promptly forgot about it because I didn't ever think that anyone would want to publish it. And when they wrote back to say that they wanted to publish it, I had actually forgotten. Like I just had written it off. Um, but in fact, I owe the entire, my, basically my entire writing career in romance to my friend, Ani, who I wanted to write a story for and who encouraged me and like told me to write more things. And she's still my, my best reader. So 
That is that is so amazing. And I've I've heard stories like that before where people start in fan fiction or they start writing a story for a friend or something. And I feel like that pure place, like holding on to that love, like that's why you're doing it. You want to connect with no. About, you want to tell a story that matters is like the most pure exciting way to start because then once you're actually bound to a contract it gets a little harder absolutely and i think that that one of the things that i love so much about that being my origin story kind of is like i think that most of us do try to write with an ideal reader in mind and for some of us we're our own ideal reader but um i i love that when i'm writing something i know that i will send it to her and she has very high standards and she's very smart and she is an English professor. And if I'm messing it up, she will tell me. Um, and like, not all my readers, like I know that she's not representative of everyone, but I, I really like having in my mind, what will this person think of this thing? Uh, I think that that's a helpful barometer for whether or not I'm succeeding at the task that I'm trying to, trying to do. Can we talk about, we have some amazing questions in the chat, which I don't want to talk over our, our viewers, but I have one question because knowing that you have a PhD, I have an MF in creative writing and not to dis MFA programs or education in any way, because I learned things there that I would not clearly be able to function without. I value my education and appreciate it, but it, it did getting a PhD or having the formal education actually help you to learn novel structure, how to write, like, how, yeah. Yeah. amen. I didn't, um, and I don't think it was trying to, you know, I think that it, it's an interesting question because I 100% spent seven years getting a PhD that as of now, you could technically say I have never used, um, or I mean, I did for a couple of years when I was adjuncting, and people ask me sometimes, like family members, when they learn that I left academia are like, but you spent seven years, blah, blah, blah. And I loved those seven years. I loved grad school. People have horror stories about their getting their PhDs and the work and everything. And I like legit loved it. Um, the part that I didn't actually like as much was the professionalization part. Um, the grading I hated and the glad handing and the being on committees and the people, that was all the parts that I didn't like. Um, and I think that it did not help me with novel structure. I, and I, this is like, I say this with complete neutrality because I don't want anyone else to feel bad if they also were in the same state that I was in. I went to college and was an English major and I got my PhD in English. And when I saw people talking about the three act structure as a narrative tool, I could not with a gun to my head have told you what, what the three act structure was. I knew it was a thing. I knew people talked about it in drama. Um, but like I was a modernist, I studied the modernist novel. There was no freaking three act structure. Um, it was like fragmentation, dissolution and despair. And <laughs> that's all it was. And so, I mean, I think that like, do I know how to analyze a text? Yes. Um, do I know a lot of stuff about culture? Yes. Was it at all helpful for me in terms of writing? Quite the contrary. Um, when I wrote my first book, I had never written a novel before. I'd written fiction in college, some poetry in college, but I sat down to write it and I have always been a big reader. But when I got the rights back to that book and self-published it, the only thing that I changed, or like I, I didn't, I could have obviously re-edited it and I wouldn't have let myself, but the paragraphs went on for eternity because academic paragraphs go on for eternity. And I... I was like, I didn't have a Kindle when I wrote that book and I never read on an e-reader. And when I looked at that book on an e-reader, these paragraphs went on for like five screens. And so the only thing I allowed myself to change except for like one little tiny detail was um, I broke all the paragraphs into three paragraphs. Um, so like in fact, academic writing trained me to write paragraphs that were far too long and that is something that I've had to relearn. <laughs> Have to untrain yourself on. Yeah. Well, let's go to this question because I think it's great, but I will probably come back to structure and all of that good stuff from education. There's so much there, but <laughs> the day writing routine and Charlotte Ann loves your books as we all oh, do. Thank you, Charlotte Ann. Um, well, I love this question because I am so excited to hear about other people's 
routines. Uh, I don't know why it's a thing that like creatives like to know about other creatives processes or something. Maybe because we're all, they're all so individual that it it makes us feel better to know that other people's are as like weird and structured or non-structured as ours. Um, so my writing routine when I'm working on a book is I like to use Pacemaker, which is a free online software. Um, and I'll enter in like the date that I'm starting the book and the date that the book is due. Um, and then I X out days, like I try not to write on the weekends or if I know I'm going to be on a trip, I X those out in the program. And then it gives me a word count per day that I have to hit in order to, to meet my deadline. And I find that really useful because I'm extremely bad with time, uh, like minute and hour time and also like week and month time and also dates in general. Um, so like just having in my mind, this book is due in two months is like not, not helpful. So I, every morning will go and I'll check my pacemaker and it will tell me how many words I'm supposed to write. And I don't know how granular you're interested in me being Charlotte Ann, but I try to keep my expected word count at 3000 or below. Um, I find that like when I'm right more than that in a day, it's kind of hard for me the next day. I feel a little bit burnt out. Um, and yeah, and I, so I, that's what I know I have to write for the day. And I try to do my writing first always. Um, I don't let myself look at email. I don't let myself look at social media. In fact, I turn my phone on do not disturb and I turn off like, I mean, I don't turn off the internet, but I like close the <laughs> internet tab. You know what the internet is, uh, the window, I close the window um, and I won't look at it until I'm done with my words for the day. And sometimes that takes until 10 a.m. and sometimes that takes until 6 p.m. But I have my word count for the day and I won't let myself do anything else until I hit it. Um, that's complicated, obviously, on days when I have other things to do, um, like editing or, you know, all the other things that uh, having a business, which is what pu pu publishing your stuff is essentially is. Um, but yeah, and recently I've actually just started, I, I go back and forth between whether I write in sprints or not. Um, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but I've just started using an alpha smart electric keyboard thing oh uh, or I would show it to you but one of those like I never used this because maybe I'm too old but apparently they used to use them in schools to teach kids it basically looks like a keyboard with like a little um calculator window at the top and it has no internet or whatever it's just a keyboard and so you can't really go back up I mean you can but like you can't really see what you've written mm -hmm. it's there's no use in fixing typos because there's no mouse <clears throat> but it's totally distraction free so I've been using that lately and I have to say, I, I was curious about it and I heard a couple other authors talking about it and I wanted to believe that it was bunk because I, I, it seems so ridiculous to have this like tool from 2002. Um, but I love it. It's so great. It's impossible to type on. I've 6,000 typos per line and, uh, it's nice to see that although I've been typing for like 30 years, I can't type. But, oh yeah, that's exactly the one I have. <laughs> it's that cl almost clear blue that the old IMAX used to be. Like that was my first computer that I ever had. It's the same color. Um, but yeah, so I really like it and it cuts down on distractions and it's really nice because you can like take it, put it in your bag and take it to the park or a coffee shop or whatever. Um, and the, the best thing I think is when we can ever travel again is um, I like to write on the train a lot. And um, I sometimes have gotten into trouble where I'm working on something and with my laptop open, like whoever's sitting next to me can just read what I'm writing. And I was on an airplane once writing a sex scene and I had my computer like this and I was sort of like trying to write like this because I didn't want the person sitting next to me who was like this middle-aged business dude to be looking over my shoulder at what I was writing. And with this, no one can read anything, so. I'm sorry. Word count has to happen, even if you're in the middle seat. Totally. <laughs> has to happen. How about your actual process, though? So if your goal for the day, let's say, is 3,000 words, are you writing yeah. to an outline? Are you a total pantser? Like, how prepared are you before you sit down yeah. for that 3,000 word goal? I am a combo. I, I definitely need to outline because 
I love to meander through a world. And so, which is fine if you're self-publishing and you don't mind a longer book and your readers like know that that's what to expect from you. But the, the last four books that I've been writing have been for Karina Press and Harlequin Special, excuse me, editions. And those have a strict word count. And I have had never written to word count before. Like I'd had a ballpark, but when I was told like, okay, but this book can be 65,000 words. I was like, but how do you write a, how could you possibly know how many words a book is going to be? Um, and <laughs> the, the, my lovely editor, Carrie was like, well, just take one of your first books and write half that length. Um, Cause I think in the middle of somewhere is legit like 140,000 words, it's super long. It doesn't need to be that long. Um, so yeah, I have to outline because otherwise I'm like, if I write a side character, suddenly I just want to have the side character and the main character, like sitting in a field of daisies talking about philosophy or whatever. Um, and although I would like to read that, I'm in the vast minority. <laughs> um, so I do outline because I, it's like a way of corralling the story into a kind of like a vaguely satisfying three act structure. Um, so usually I will do um, a lot of, most of what I do is character work. I, I actually like, at the risk of sounding very pat, I don't care about plot very much in romance. Um, I love a great plot, but, um, if I love the characters, I kind of don't care what they're doing as a reader. I mean, and so as a writer, I, I'm just like, well, like, if I'm honest, I just write whatever, like a story that's about whatever I'm interested in at that moment. So. Um, if you if like anyone has read most of my books, you can tell really clearly what I was into at that moment, like really into baking, really getting into flowers, really getting into home improvement. Like it's it's pretty clear. Um, but yeah, so I mostly do character arc plotting. So I'm, I, I know where my characters are starting out. I know where they need to end up. And then it's kind of about like uh, putting into place the pieces like things that would need to happen in order to make the characters change the way they would need to, to, to start here and then end up here. Um, and then when I know the setting and I know who the other character is, they're, they're actually, it just kind of like narrows it down. Um, so yeah, I'm mostly, mostly plotting based on character and theme and I will write a general outline, but I don't really plan out scenes. Um, I don't really plan out, details uh i mostly start off with like a very general a general outline and a kind of like hit this point hit this point hit this point and i do try to make sure that i know like what the what the dark moment is going to be or whatever you call it the heartbreak moment um but yeah, mostly I just think a lot about my characters. And as I'm, when I'm working on a book, I'm like kind of wandering around the world, seeing everything through that lens. Um, so I, I, I tend to kind of like use a trawling net. And like, if I see it happen outside, I'm like putting that in the book. Right. right. What about when you're writing a series? So for Garnet Run, did you start with Simon and Jack and think, oh, I, there are so many characters here. I'm telling all these stories. Or how does developing a series fall into place for you? Yeah, um, I love secondary characters so much. And so I love writing series because it means that like that character that you mention a little bit in the first book, mm -hmm. of course, gets to have their own book uh, in book two or book three or book four. So I knew that I was going to be writing two books for Karina, but I didn't know what the second book was going to be exactly. Um, and so when I was writing uh, uh, Better Than People, and I wrote in Charlie, I was like, oh, Charlie, I like Charlie. I, I, I want Charlie to have a book. And so I think it kind of works the same as like, as a reader, you read a book and if there's a secondary character that you kind of connect to, you're like, oh, I hope they get their own book. Um, I think for me, part of writing a series is like, I like to imagine, I mean, of course each book has to stand on its own, but I like to imagine the reader who's reading them all at once, once they're all published, because I want to make sure that it's a satisfying arc from actually book one to book done. Um, Cause sometimes, I mean, there are certainly series that you can read in any order and maybe it's not as important then, but I always read in order. And so um, with this book, I actually just 
am going to finish book four in this series on Monday, if my word count is correct. Um, and I've, I thought hard about like, I want to make sure that the end of the fourth book in this series is satisfying to the reader who doesn't actually even pick up book one until book four is out. And it's a little weird because books one and two are with Karina and books three and four are with special editions, but it's all one series. Um, but I want to make sure that that reader who's like been with the characters the entire time feels satisfied at the end of book four that like not just each individual book has had its arc, but that the series has actually had an arc as well. Because I think of a series as a character in and of itself, which is like, you kind of have to grow as the series kind of has to grow. And there has to be some kind of question that resonates throughout the series that gets spoken to by the end of the series. Otherwise, like, couldn't those books just have stood on their own? Um, so, and I don't really plan that going in to be honest it just kind of like it's just in the back of my mind and I hope it falls into place and then if it doesn't I try really hard in edits to make it fall into place <laughs> is that uh -huh. something you talk about too like the challenge or not maybe it isn't at all just publishing a series but splitting it you know between two different imprints so you've got two under Karina two under special edition as a writer does that even matter to you they're all coming out they'll all be available Right. I, it's an interesting question. I kind of don't know if it will matter to me yet in reality, because the third book isn't out yet, which will be the first one um, for special editions. In theory, it doesn't matter to me at all. It wouldn't matter to me if they were coming out from like different publishing houses. Like it's a series. I wrote it as a series. That's it. But from a, from a like business standpoint, it's interesting because Karina and special editions don't have the same rules. Um, and so there are things in the first two books, like for example, the level of graphicness and the sex scenes that, and I had the same editor for all four books, Carrie, she's wonderful. Um, that when we got to the special editions books and like full disclosure, I have I had never read a special editions book. I had never read a Harlequin book. Um, when I signed that contract. And so I did not know what those books were. Mm -hmm. And when I started writing the third book, I was like, hey, Carrie, just so you know, I actually think this book wants to be in first person. So I'm I'm doing this one in first person, even though books one and two are in third. And she wrote back and was like, ooh, so glad you mentioned that because actually special editions books are always in third person with an alternating POV. And she hadn't told me that because she assumed I knew. But I hadn't known. And then when we got to the, when we were doing edits and we got to the sex scenes, she was like, okay, we just need to make this a little more sensual and less explicit. And to me, I was like, oh, this is not explicit. I have way more explicit sex scenes. Um, so, so I like went to look at another Harlequin special edition book to see, to make sure that I knew what, what I could do and couldn't do. Um, and I, I kind of think it doesn't matter in the end but definitely there are, like, you can't really swear in special editions books much, or you can get away with a couple. And I say fuck every other word. At my books, I swear to God, if you, like, counted up the fucks in my books, it would reach the moon. And I had a really hard time. That was, like, literally any other word. I don't care. But that one was really, really hard for me. And I, I eventually had to just write it with the fucks in and then edit them out because every time I got to one, I was like, what words do people use if you don't use this one? It's like an exclamation point. Um, anyway, so, so like from a from a large, from a business point, business perspective, what I think is interesting is that book three in the Garnet Run series, which will be the first special editions book, is the first queer book that Harlequin is putting out in one of their lines, which is really really cool, and also Huge. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Um, there are, like for anyone who like me didn't know, this, the, the Harlequin lines, like there are people who they just read every single book that comes out from special editions, which means that it's a great opportunity, but also it's a, it's a cold audience. So they will never have read my, any of my books before. They might never have read a queer romance before. Um, and they just will buy it because it's one of the special editions books. And having a cold audience come to your work is um, intimidating, I guess, but also 
I'm kind of excited. Like I sort of hope people hate it and get really mad about it and show their asses in public and I get to see it uh, if I'm honest. But from a business standpoint, like that book is serving a very different function for Harlequin than the two Karina books are. And this may be super boring for people who are not, who don't like care about publishing, but um, they are packaging, they're essentially packaging a book for readers who might be actively hostile to it. And so we'll see. I mean, it is like a tame, it's a very sweet, like holiday book, which I love to write because as a like Jewish kid, I grew up like most Jewish kids obsessed with Christmas. Um, maybe not like most Jewish kids, but uh, yeah, it's like a Christmas book. It's really sweet. And I'm just imagining like, people might send hate mail about this like really sweet soft book because it's gay um so yeah from a from a business standpoint it makes a huge difference whereas me when i was writing it i was like mm, i don't care <clears throat> well and i think that's too sort of aspiring authors don't really understand that all of those things it's not just about writing a story that you love that reads well that matters to you there's actually a whole business infrastructure behind publishing that you know, the voice might be a little different. That's, that's actually a, maybe it's a little too gritty, but in terms of your voice, like you write so lyrically and so beautifully. And I think show people that this genre is not cookie cutter. Like this is what a romance is and this is how it sounds. I mean, your writing is so beautiful. Thank did you, you feel, oh, <laughs> did you have to shift or did you feel the editing process for, have you finished the editing process for the special edition yet? So, okay. How yeah. did that work? Your editor's amazing. You love Carrie, but from Korea to special edition, how did that, did you find other than just, you know, the heat level and all that, which heat level, who even? Who knows? <laughs> um, no, actually, I think when, uh, one of the reasons why having an editor be consistent across the the books really helped um, because Carrie, and actually before I even signed the contract, I was very clear like I, I made very sure that I wouldn't be expected to change my voice because that would be a deal breaker for me. I, I have no interest in writing something that I don't want to write. If I wanted to spend my day doing things I didn't want to do, I would have still be working as a standardized patient. Um, <laughs> like I, I want to be able to write what I want. Otherwise there's no point in doing it. So um, yeah. So I was like very, very clear with Carrie and told her that that was a deal breaker for me. And, and she promised that that wouldn't be the case. So I feel really lucky that um, I did not have to, like I really wrote the books the same way that I would have written them, even if I'd been self-publishing them, except that I took out the literal fucks. Um, <laughs> and the, I edited like a couple words out of the sex scenes, even like, even those, um, it turns out, I mean, this is just a craft thing. Like, I think it's easy sometimes I don't mean to set up a straw man here, but like, I think that often on Twitter, we see people being like, never compromise your vision or like it's selling out to do X, Y, or Z. And I really am empathetic to the standpoint of that. But I think so often, if you're good at what you do, you can change small things to fit in with restrictions without compromising anything. Like the fact that I happen to say fuck a lot is not a political standing. Like that's not a, a perspective, that is a habit. It doesn't add anything to my books. You know, it's like I, I could just as easily write characters who use other words. And so I thought that it was actually a great lesson for me. I, I am bad at following rules. I do not like being told what to do. I am extremely irksome and rebellious when people try. And so um, it was a great lesson for me to be like, hey, you're not actually giving anything up or sacrificing anything to just like use a different word. And there are certain lines that don't need to be held because they actually are meaningless. And they're just things that you do automatically, but automization doesn't equal uh, investment. I bet you're a dream to edit though, because it's really, it can be really challenging to know what is my voice? What is compromising my voice? And so even just that perspective, like, is it really something, is that the hill you're going to go on or not? 
Oh yeah, yeah, totally. And editing, I mean, I love to edit. I think editing is, oh, it's just, it's like the difference between a good book and a bad book. And I, I believe that no matter how good your first draft is. Um, but I think there's this magic that we often ascribe to the word that we chose um, in editing. It's like when we're writing, I mean, I sometimes will write, I, I, I know what the word is and I know what the the beats are, like the syllables and the emphasis, but I can't think of the word. So mm -hmm. I'll write like, da 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 to tell myself which word it is. And like eventually then later I'll go and like look it up on thesaurus.com. So this is like the level of um, ex expertise and like detail that I'm bringing to the writing process. And then on in editing, then sometimes we'll be like, no, these words are sacrosanct. Everyone was chosen with right. such love and care. And it's like, no, I wrote the book. I know that I was going through and like, words, 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 words. <laughs> and um, I think that's a really useful thing for me to remember is that like, probably I would have changed that word anyway if I were going back to edit it myself. And so the fact that an editor has changed it, like, I don't, there's no defensiveness because it's, it's like, I know what the process of writing was like and how often I was like, eh, it's some word like that. I don't know, but I don't want to break the flow. So I just keep going. And I think that the same is true for like when editors or copy editors ask questions. Um, I just think the defensiveness is so useless. There's no point to it because you're alone in your house. No one can hear you. No one can see you. The editor, it's, you're not a com on a conversation with the editor. And I've had friends who like write whole paragraphs back defending why they did what they did or explaining it. And I'm like, that editor's not even going to see it because it's going to go on to the copy editor next. Like you are talking to no one and it's a waste of time and it's a waste of energy. And the question is, does this change make the work better or not? Does it communicate something more clearly or not? There's no other question. I know. And the issue, too, is if one reader got snagged on that, whether you disagree or agree, the odds are that hundreds more will. There's never just one outline that comes out. You know, unfortunately, yep. it'd be nice to say, the editor's a jerk. I'm not changing this. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And the um, the one edit that I have ever like there, I, there I've had moments where someone just uh, fundamentally misunderstood what I said. And once I said, oh, no, it's this. They're like, oh, of course, I just read it wrong, which whatever. But the one comment that I ever got in edits, that this was like a copy editor who is not someone that I had ever worked with before or knew um, the one comment that I ever was like, this is bullshit and I'm annoyed about it was a like a random copy editor who was like, it's unrealistic that so many of these characters are gay. Are you sure that you want all the secondary characters to be gay too? And I had a, I like typed the angry paragraph and blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, this guy doesn't care. He's just a copy editor for Penguin Random House. And he's like, doesn't know this genre. So I deleted it and I just wrote Stet and that was it. Because that was the thing that like that fundamentally would compromise the view of the world that is important to me. Um, but again, it's like I had all the power. And I think that's a thing that like when people ask me about editing and I, I really like editing. And so sometimes I end up on panels with people who hate editing to try to like even it out. Um, and I think the the thing that I feel most strongly is you you never have more power than when you're editing because the work already exists the groundwork has been laid and what you're doing is like decorating the house. So you can turn it into anything. You can tweak things. If there's a wall that's too big, you can put up a big piece of artwork and make it look smaller or whatever. And someone coming in and being like, oh, hey, I actually am door to door selling things for houses. Do you want this one? You can just say no. Or you can be like, yes, actually, that's exactly what I need for the kitchen. But like you are in a position of complete and total power. The creative labor has been done. And now you are like polishing it up and making it shine beautifully. And nobody can do anything about it, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to be damaged at that point. The house yeah. is not down. Like poor right. We haven't even talked enough about the book, but we have a question. Don't oh, yeah. want to because it's very beautiful and long. Um, and I don't know if you can see the whole comment, but it's, I love that you wrote in the middle of somewhere for your friend, chapter by chapter. 
such a special story for your first published work. So what's a piece of advice you think every writer trying to get started now should know? And then the rest of it, let me hide this and I'll just tell you, it's a compliment how much you love your work, so. Oh. Um, okay. Advice. I think the piece of advice that I would say to any writer is you will only write the book if you love it because writing a book it's not even that it's that hard it's not even that it takes that long like if I'm being completely honest some of them are hard some of them do take a long time but like the, the, the any random book it doesn't take that long and it's not that hard what it is is a thing you have to keep doing over and over and over each time you sit down in order for it to ever get done. And if you don't love it, you're doing it for other reasons. You're doing it because you want the accomplishment, because you want to make money, because you want to prove to someone that you can do something they said you couldn't do, or maybe prove it to yourself. Like there are all these um, para craft reasons why you're doing what you're doing. And none of them are really powerful enough to sustain the process of writing a book. Um, but the one thing that always will sustain it is love of the story that you're telling, falling in love with your characters, desperately wanting to find out what's going to happen to them, um, caring a lot that you're writing a story that you wish you could have read but never saw out there, writing something for someone else that you know that, that they will love and will be meaningful to them. Um, and you will know when your story is that story because you'll be so bursting with excitement to sit down and put it out in the world that it won't feel, um, it won't feel like drudgery. I mean, it'll feel like work because anything like that is work, but it'll be the kind of work that you're like, cool, I get to tell this story. And, and you'll have thoughts about it. Like, I can't wait until a kid like me reads that book or oh my gosh, it'll be so neat to get to the end and like they won't even know what's, what hit them. Um, and I think until you until you find that story, there's no point. I mean, writing is always great. It's great to practice. It's great to play around, but that's not the same thing as writing a, writing a book. Um, so yeah, write something that you really love and are excited about because that's the only thing that's really enough to sustain the process until the end. Well, and I think that leads perfectly into this question. So when you feel discouraged, do you, do you deal with feelings of writer's block, you know, imposter syndrome, any of that? And how do you get out of your own head to actually do your 3000 words a day? Yeah, totally. <clears throat> I definitely deal with imposter syndrome. Um, I think I, I tend to find that writer's block is, can be broken down for me anyway, into a couple of different diseases or like symptoms, whatever. Um, there's the kind of, and I don't really think of them mostly as writer's block there. There's like, what do I do when I wake up in the morning and I sit down to write and I'm just like, I don't feel like this today. I just don't want to. And on those days, if I have a grace period, like if I have enough time built into my draft, I take the day off. I don't do it because one of the things that I love so much about working for myself is that I get to do whatever I want. Did I mention I'm bad at following rules? Um, <laughs> it's just like, I don't know, like getting to do what you want is uh, like a consolation for having to be an adult in all these other ways. You know, like you have to do the fucking laundry, you have to take your car to the shop, you have to get groceries, like you have to do all these bullshit things that suck. The only consolation is that in the interstices of those suck pillars, you get to actually do whatever you want. And so I, I love taking the day off. I love like, when I can. I love being like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going on a walk or I'm going to watch TV all day or I'm going to play in the garden or whatever. Um, so when it's just like a real kind of like, wah, wah, I don't want to. If I have time, I let myself take the day off. I find it really useful, useful and restorative because then I know that the next day when I choose to write, I'm choosing it. And that feels really positive. Um, then there's the kind of, of, I don't want to, or discouragement where I sit down and I'm like, I have to work today because I have a deadline. 
I like this book. I just like don't know what's going to happen next. And I'm not in the mood to make choices. Um, one of the things that I think I, I think about all the time, but I don't think it's talked about enough in, in writing circles is that when you write fiction, what you do all day long or all through your writing process is make choices. Every single word is a choice. Every, every setting, every outfit, everything is choices. And there's this thing like legitimate thing called decision fatigue, which is that we only have the willpower to make so many choices in any one day. And sometimes what happens is I just have used up my decision-making stuff, uh, willpower, whatever. And on those days, I know that what I have to do is like go back to my outline and see what the path of least resistance is. So like if I don't know what's supposed to happen next, I know that I need just need to spend like a half an hour doing some some plotting. And so I'll go back to my outline and I'll be like, just do it for five minutes, just five minutes. And usually that's all it takes. Or by five minutes, I'm like, oh, I've got the seed of an idea. So then it, I do the, the rest of the 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And usually it's just about being like, I'm here and I need to get here. I know A and I know C. So like, what is the logical thing that is B? And then once I know that and I know what's supposed to happen, the writing is fun and fine. So that's like the second one. Then the third one is I don't want to write because I hate this book. It's garbage. It is terrible. Why would I even bother writing it? Because no one will ever want to read it. And that is a really normal way to feel. I think, I think anyone who's written more than one book also knows that like that feeling doesn't usually translate into any outcome. It's not like the books that you feel that way about end up being bad and the books you don't feel that way about end up being good. They all end up being whatever they end up being. And some books you just feel that way about and some you don't. And for me, when I have that feeling, um, that's like part imposter syndrome and part I'm mailing it in. And I know in those moments that I don't like the book, that I'm just not trying hard enough. And like, I, I wish I had better advice for like how to get over that one, but there isn't any really except try harder. <laughs> um, and, but it's, it is like, I think there's, I have no problem with anyone sharing word counts on Twitter or being like, I just hit my blah, blah, blah words. I think that's great for some people and they love seeing um, other people's whatever. But I think that in the quanta, like in the fetishization of quantification, we often forget that like thinking for three hours is actually way more important than writing 3000 words or whatever. Thinking for three hours will get you the next 50,000 words. Um, or like, there are some books that come really easily. Like I wrote Riven. That's like the first draft. I barely edited that book at all. It just came out. It, it just like plopped out. Um, whereas a uh, small change, I rewrote that book like six times. It just wasn't working. And, and I, and like, I, I just know that that is a thing that happens. Like some books come out kind of fully formed. Some come out a mangled mess and some are in between. And it doesn't really, it's, it's, it's inexplicable. Like I haven't noticed any pattern to predict it. Uh, it just happens. But in the moments when I'm kind of like, this book sucks and I don't want to, what I generally have to say to myself is this is just a feeling it'll pass. And all you can do is like dig back in and see why it's boring to you because it'll, that'll make it boring for a reader too. And just make it more interesting. <laughs> That's the thing people don't like when you say you don't have time to write or you don't have time, like we have so much enforced psychological downtime. You know, you're doing the dishes, you're waiting in line. Like that's all productive time where yeah. please pay attention on the road. But yeah. you know, your brain can be thinking, you can be thinking through like those options of if I'm stuck on a plot point, what are all the possibilities here? What would yeah. be great? What would be boring? And then you settle on something. Like you said, when you sit down, the words come out. That's, I yeah. that. And I think that the, like the most useful thing for that kind of writer's block or whatever you want to call it is figuring out which is the best way for you to work through that. So for me, it's really helpful for me to talk it out. 
I don't actually even need another person. I just need to vocalize it, even if I'm just alone in a room. Because one of, actually, here's something that being an academ academic really did teach me, um, is that when you're thinking about anything complicated, and uh, books definitely count as complicated, no matter what the book is, when you're thinking about something complicated, you can have 50 thoughts at once. And when you're speaking out loud, and when you're writing, you can only write or say one thing at once. And so when you start from the tangled like spaghetti ball or yarn ball of your 50 thoughts at once, and you try to translate that into writing, it's expecting that you're going to pull the thread and the whole thing is going to effortlessly fall open. And anyone who's ever eaten spaghetti or knitted knows that that's not what happens. You pull it and the knot just gets tighter or you end up with a bite that's like the size of your own face on your fork. And so I think for me, like speaking it forces me to untangle what is actually like a, a ball of multiple thoughts at once, because I can only say one thing at a time. And so if I tell myself the story out loud or like talk through it and say, okay, well, maybe what happens is that, um, I don't know, rye gets eaten by a shark. Then I can be like, well, there are several logical problems with that. <laughs> Biggest of which being that there is no body of water <laughs> large enough for a shark in Wyoming. Okay, so maybe not that one. Um, and like, obviously, that's a ridiculous example, but there are, but usually I can like talk through it in a way that feels clarifying, um, that's different than just thinking. And speaking something out loud is way closer to writing. And so if I can say it out loud, I can simplify it enough to the point that usually I can write it. And I don't mean simplify like, dumb it down i mean simplify like untangle um and whereas i know some other people like journaling is really good for them that way or uh going for a walk or whatever so like whatever your thing is and you won't know until you try multiple of them um figuring out which is the best way for you to kind of like either untangle if you hit a snag or think of like produce ideas if you're kind of at a loss figuring out which one is most productive for you i think is a really really good tool because you're definitely going to hit that problem at some point in your career oh, that's so helpful that in thinking about it that way just the way your brain works is a really helpful way to articulate like all these choices and writers can either be too many ideas too few or just not making that decision all so yeah insightful and helpful. Yeah, good. Yeah. And the, the making choices, I, I think that like at the end of the day, when I'm working on a book, I never can decide what to have for dinner because my decision has decision making has been used up. Whereas when I'm between books, I'm like, yes, I'm going to make. And then it's like this elaborate meal. And it's such a clear, it's so, so evidentiary for me of the fact that like that work it might be fictional work, but the your brain doesn't know the difference between a fictional and a non-fictional decision. And so sometimes like, it's really great. I, I like, I repeat this because I think if that's not something that you're thinking about, it's really easy to be like, why, what's wrong with my brain? Like, why am I not able to think of these things or make choices? And there's nothing wrong with your brain. You just may have exhausted your ability to make choices that day or that week like it's a finite resource and creating fiction uses up a lot of it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm so glad you said that because it is tiring, it is work, even though hopefully it's coming from a place of joy. And clearly, I feel like we could talk, I could talk to you for another two hours <laughs> just about this book and about these yeah. books, but I don't want to take up your whole Sunday. And I do want people to know you're so sweet. You're so wonderful. I do want people to know we are giving away um, a copy of these two books, Better Than People and Best Laid Plans. So feel free to enter if you'd like to enter to win those. We have some restrictions on eligibility, but not too much. You can read about it. Please do follow uh, Roan on social media. Sign up for the newsletter if you'd like. Uh, there's a free. Do you want to explain what they get when they sign up a new sign up? Oh, sure. Yeah. If you sign up for my newsletter, I have a very cute, well, I think it's cute, um, holiday romance story to give away called A Reluctant Santa, which is about um, a guy who has no interest whatsoever in Christmas, who suddenly starts receiving these mysterious packages to his apartment door. And they all look like Christmas gifts. And he's like, what the hell? And he realizes that someone has put the wrong address on something. So he's receiving all of his neighbor's 
gifts and he keeps having to like deliver them up to his neighbor and spoiler alert they fall in love <laughs> anyway, yeah. it's pretty cute <laughs> That's amazing. You are amazing. It's been so wonderful and fun to spend the time with you. Really thank you for giving up your time on Sunday, but I adore your writing. Love this book. And when is the third one coming out? When is the special edition releasing? The third one is coming out in October, but I don't think we have an exact publication date yet. But if you do sign up for my newsletter, you will know the second that there's a release date. Um, and yeah, it comes out in October, which is, I guess, when holiday books come out. Um, so it is a holiday book. It will be out in October. I'm bummed we have to wait till October, but between <laughs> now and then, if people want more of you, more of your content, you're doing a podcast now too. Did you want to talk yeah. about that? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. So I, I just started a podcast with, uh, Zio Axelrod and Avery Flynn, who are two other romance writers. It's called Dear Romance Writer, and it's an advice podcast, um, and yeah, we are having so much fun with it. So you can find it on any podcast network. Uh, you can also like just to listen or you can watch it on YouTube if you want. We have a website, which is dearromancewriter.com where you can like read the show notes and get all of our recommendations for stuff. And on that website, there's also a form where you can send us a question and totally anonymously. So if you, if you need advice on anything to do with relationships, could be friendship or family, doesn't have to be romantic. Um, yeah, you can you can send them to us that way. And we are also on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and you can send us questions that way too. It is a blast. We would love to have you listen. Oh my God, I love telling people what to do. <laughs> That's amazing. And I know you're amazing at it. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. Thank we'll have so to do this again because I have a thousand more questions for you. I would love to do anytime. Thank you. Love your writing. Love your books. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. Thanks to everyone for attending too. Have Thanks, Sarah. Again. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.